Just over that rise and up this secluded country lane lives one of the world's great drivers, Daryl Waltrip. Hi, I'm Brock Yates, and in this peaceful country setting outside Franklin, Tennessee, we're going to spend some time with this brilliant, often controversial driver away from the sound and the fury of the racetracks. Waltrip entered Grand National Competition 11 years ago, his career has been filled with superlatives. In fact, it took him only 49 races before he won his first Grand National event, just down the road in Nashville. Within six years, he'd won a million dollars in purses and was considered to be among an elite of perhaps a dozen top drivers in the world. Ten years after beginning his Grand National driving, he'd won over 50 races and more than three million dollars. A bright, forthright young man of 35, whose quick wit and penchant for frankness has often placed him at the center of controversy, Walter is the source of an odd love-hate relationship with stock car racing fans. But his brilliance behind the wheel is unquestioned. Since 1975, he's compiled the best winning record of any NASCAR driver with 51 victories. He has won wherever the big stock cars have run, on super speedways, short tracks, and road courses. And now he stands at the very pinnacle of the sport he chose as a typical teenager growing up in his hometown of Owensboro, Kentucky. The past decade has been packed with drama for Walter, ranging from its epic come from behind winning of the first two consecutive NASCAR driving championships to several harrowing high-speed crashes. Franklin, Tennessee is a picturesque little town steeped in Civil War history, and it provides an interesting contrast to Waltrip's professional career. We're thinking about buying a 60-acre farm and having some cows and some horses and some chickens and, you know, trying to... The racing life is so hectic. I've been gone for six weeks, solid. I haven't been home. This is the first day I've been home in six weeks. You really, you come back home and you can't absorb it all fast enough. I mean, in my house and, and, you know, I want to get out here and walk around and see what's happened to this place while I was gone. and. I think I'd be even more uh, prone to stay at home more than I do if I had a farm, a place that, you know, there's something about working in the dirt and, and having animals and a barn, and, and I think it's, it's uh, um, the American way, I guess, to own a piece of property and take care of it. Yeah. I know, there's something about animals that uh, I, uh, you know, I always use it as kind of a judge of people. If, Somebody that says, I hate animals, I always wonder about it. I well, wonder there's something lacking in their soul somewhere. There is. It, uh, do you buy him as a puppy? Yeah. You know, it's a funny thing. We went to uh, dinner one night down at the uh, mall, went to the cafeteria. And uh, after we got to eat, we always go in the pet shop. So we went in the pet shop, and Frank was in the cage, and he was he was big. He was like three months old, and that was he was a big dog. And he was laying in the cage. His tail was running up the back of the cage. <laughs> His nose was pressed against the front of the cage, and his paws were pressed against the front of the cage. And he was just laying there, just, you know, in a stupor. And we walked over, and, and uh, I saw him, and I said, oh, my Lord, I can't believe it. And I pecked on the, there was a glass between us. I pecked on the window, and he never changed his expression or nothing. He never changed his tail run up the back of that wall. It just started going, dun, 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 dun. And I told Stevie, I said, we got to get I'm that hooked. dog out of there. And so that's where he came from. He's the only animal we ever bought, but <laughs> it tells you a lot about how we spend our money. <laughs> Carol, I know living in a little town like Franklin, Tennessee, has a lot of benefits. You get to know an awful lot of people, and there's a story about the famous uh, jam cake uh, <laughs> episode. Tell us again about how that all developed. Well, there's a, a little delicatessen down in town here where... We all have lunch every day. Uh, most all the businessmen, all my friends and, and buddies all run into each other at lunchtime. And it's Lila's Deli. And uh, Lila, Lila is a good friend of, our, of Stevie's and mine. And I used to go in there prior to a race, and she made this jam cake. And man, it was so good. And I'd always get a piece of jam cake before I left town to go to a race. The times that I did get it, I'd win. And the times that I didn't, well, I wouldn't, coincidentally. So Lila became, she just knew that it was the jam cake that was making me win. 
So, boy, she'd call on the phone and say, okay, come in today, I got a fresh jam cake made. And I'd go down and eat a big piece of jam cake. And if I forgot to, it got to the point where she would have it sent to me. She'd Federal Express it to me or, or UPS it to me or get it to me some way at a racetrack so I'd be sure and have my jam cake. And that went on for a couple of years. And it just really became a thing, you know. It just had to have my jam cake. Have you, are, are you off the habit now? Or? <laughs> I kicked the habit. <laughs> I'm, on to, I'm on to something better than that now. <laughs> Jerry, you're, you have something with a reputation for being controversial. Is that a, do you consider that a bum rap? I, I believe it is. Uh, I'm not controversial. I, I never, ha I don't, I don't try to be controversial. I've tried to, uh, I've tried to be creative. Maybe that's, maybe that's a, a better way to put it. I, my perspective maybe has been different than other people's that have come into this business before me. But I've never meant to be controversial. And, and there were times, i tell you what happened to me. I came into this sport, an unknown, raced in Nashville, had won everything you could win in Nashville and around little racetracks in the, in the uh, southeast here. But nobody knew who Darrell Walker was. So I came into to the big time auto racing, as they say, and, and I didn't get a lot of attention paid to me. Nobody cared that I was there. So what? And uh, that kind of bothered me for a while because I'd been in the limelight by winning all these little races and I'd been on TV and radio and newspaper in the local areas, got to the big time and they didn't even act like uh, that I existed. That kind of got on my nerves after a while. I knew I was a good race driver. I knew I could win races and I felt that I was uh, the caliber of driver and the caliber of person that could help this sport. But uh, nobody was paying any attention to me. So I have to admit that I might have created this character. Uh, Maybe the Darrell Waltrip at that time is not the same one that, that exists now. In the beginning, it was fun. I had a lot of fun teasing the other drivers. I had a lot of fun cracking, uh, making funny remarks, I thought. And the press had a lot of fun with it. They kind of picked up on it. They were having a good time. But all of a sudden, the fans said, we don't like this guy. And I don't know, maybe I, I, I don't necessarily blame them for that. I maybe I don't necessarily like the guy either, not the guy that was in it was existing then, but I think I've grown past that. I wanted, I finally got to the point where I wanted to, what I'd accomplished on the racetrack to do the talking and not what I was accomplishing off the racetrack. And I feel like I've done a good job. I've won the championship twice. I've moved up to fourth on the win list. I've just, I've accomplished so much. And now I wish people would accept me for what I've done and not what I've said. Well, Darrell, the, obviously all that, a lot of the booing is, is reflex action, I'm sure. I mean, most people, that it's, a, it's become kind of a, uh, to them, uh, I'm sure, almost a, 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 a custom. But it must bother you because it, you know that's not you and you know that, and uh, people that know you know that's not you either. The thing that's, that's aggravating or frustrating is the fact that on a one-on-one -on -one basis with any race fan, he would be my fan. On, in small groups, in my fan club, uh, in, in all the things that I, all the speeches I've given, I've gone into, into groups where people have come up and said, I'm not a fan of yours. And people have come up and said, I have booed you. But when I left that place, when they talked to me, I talked to them, we got to know each other. They came up afterwards and apologized for booing they came up afterwards and said, I wasn't a fan of yours, but I am now. And that's the big problem. I live here in Tennessee. I'm not a North, I don't live in North Carolina. That's the hub. They don't get to see me every day. They don't get to talk to me every day. I'm over here in Tennessee, well-respected and well-liked here, but not known or understood over there. And that's been a real hard thing to overcome. But it's, it's slowly but surely working out. If there was a time and one incident that you could look back on, that you'd change, to, if you could relive it again. Is there one that you can pick out where this, this thing got you sideways with <laughs> the public, as it were? Yeah, it was a couple of years ago with Charlotte, you know, when the, I crashed, uh, blew an engine and crashed, and uh, the crowd just, it was the most horrendous cheer I'd ever heard. I, I got out of my car and the fans were just going crazy. And, you know, it really hurt. It hurt my feelings, it, it hurt my pride. It hurt every, it hurt my crew, it hurt my family, it hurt all of us. And 
out of that came the the remark that uh, that I would challenge all fans to meet me at the Kmart parking lot. Those that didn't like me, meet me in the Kmart parking lot. That was not exactly how that that was meant to come out, but that's how it was. As that's how it came out. What had happened leading up to that incident on Friday night prior to the race on Sunday, I had been to a Kmart and I had signed autographs at a Kmart and there were over 2,000 fans there. They waited in a rainstorm for me to come out and sign autographs. I came out, I stayed there three hours. And I signed autographs all up to about 11 o'clock that evening. And we were doing an interview on Monday morning after the race and we were talking about the crowd reaction to my accident. And I said, I just can't understand it. On, on Friday night, I had all these fans there and they loved me and I signed autographs and it was the greatest thing I'd probably ever done. Sunday, they booed me. I said, maybe what I ought to do is challenge the ones that booed me to meet me at the Kmart in the parking lot. Because it was because of the Kmart. It was just a tie-in, you know. Well, that came out the next day in the headlines. Walter challenges fans to meet him at the Kmart. Well, that was, man, I'm telling you, it went all over the country. It was on the AP, a UPI. I was getting calls from all over the country. The story started here in Nashville. I was talking to Larry Woody, a Tennessean reporter, and I made the comment to him. He used it in his story. It went across the wire, and somebody picked up that quote out of the story and used it for a headline. The next day, I was getting calls from everywhere, Atlanta, Charlotte, Chicago, New York, wanting to know about my comment about meeting the fans in the parking lot. So it really created a lot of problems for me, and I had a hard time living it down the rest of that year. We'll be back with more from Darrell Waltrip after this. <laughs> Well, people tell us that you're a, a real perfectionist in most everything you do, especially in your driving, but also in your personal life and even even the occasional times when you hit the golf course. Is that correct? <laughs> well, you know, I, I perfectionist, I guess, is one way to put it, but my wife calls me peculiar sometimes. <laughs> I, I like things. I like things to be nice. I like. I always pride myself in taking good care of everything I have, my home my automobiles, uh, I like my race cars to be immaculate. And of course, you know, that just le one thing leads to another. Of course, daggone it, everything I get ready to do is the competition, you know. I got to be the best. Uh, I don't know why that is. Uh, I could just thinking about back uh, when I was a kid, you know, it, it was always, well, I eat one more drumstick than anybody else, or, uh, well, I went a little further than anybody else. It's always been that competition, and I think that's competition, perfectionist, all those things kind of run hand in hand. Did you drift into being a race driver or did you know from an early uh, early childhood point that you wanted to do that? You know, I used to sit around and listen to athletes say, well, ever since I was a kid, a six, seven years old, I, I wanted to do, I wanted to be a football player or I wanted to be this or I wanted to be that. But it literally is the truth. I can remember when I was six years old going to races with my grandparents in Owensboro, Kentucky and watching G.C. Spencer race on a dirt track in Owensboro. And I don't know if I got, uh, the fumes got to me or what happened, but I knew from the time I was six years old and I'd go home and, and get on my, my little tricycle or my bicycle that I wanted to be a racer. And when I got into high school, I knew I wanted to race. I was on the track team. I couldn't drive a car at that time, so I just did it on my feet. And uh, I was the best half miler in the state for a couple of years. And uh, when I got old enough to drive, I was racing go-karts all this time, too, but when I got old enough to drive, I couldn't wait to build a race car. I got a race car and a driver's license all at the same time. When did you find out in your own mind that you were good or better, for that matter, than the, the other guys? Well, when I was 12, uh, we were racing go-karts. My dad got me a go-kart, and we'd throw the thing in the trunk, and we'd run around uh, home there on Sunday afternoons racing. Sometimes it was only through a on a parking lot with hay bales, but daggone it, it didn't matter where it was or what kind of track it was or anything else, I'd always win. And uh, I guess I knew then, I, I had that instinct, that winning instinct. I had that desire that no matter how many was ahead of me or how long the race or what the deal was, I wanted to win it. And I think uh, I knew right then and there when I was 12, 13 years old that 
that given the opportunity, and that's something that's very, very hard to come by, but given the opportunity that I could be the best race driver in the world. When you began to get into Grand National Stock Car Racing, as I recall, you had a couple of seasons where things weren't so good. That you, did you ever waver? Did you ever say, this isn't for me? It was a lot tougher than I thought it was going to be. You know, you have all these visions. Uh, all I ever thought you needed was a car and a helmet and a track. And if you were the best, you would win. Well, I found out there was some more ingredients that went into that that I wasn't ready to deal with. Uh, politics was one of them. Uh, I never really knew anything about that part of racing. I assumed that everybody had a car and, you know, it went through inspection, you went out on the line and you run the race and there was nothing supposed to interfere with that other than the competition. But I found out early on that that wasn't necessarily so, that when you have a sanctioning body and, and the press and uh, all those things that you had to deal with, that that was a factor in whether you won or lost a race too. So uh, I think in about 1974, I, I had run for Rookie of the Year in 1973. I had a great year. I had the best finishes. I made the most money, but I didn't win the title. And uh, that was very discouraging, very depressing as a matter of fact, uh, because I didn't politically play the game like I was supposed to. Today, I understand it understand that there's a lot more to racing than just racing. That's what I try to tell guys all the time. Uh, there's a lot to racing on the track, but there's a whole lot to it off the racetrack, too. And in some of those early years, I thought maybe I ought to go back to racing my sportsman car at Nashville or Salem or Louisville or somewhere, Birmingham, whatever, and forget about the big time, because the big time was maybe a little more than I was ready for. Well, now you've been in the big time. You, you've won just about everything there is to win in this sport. Uh, your position is established for a long time to come, but there have got to be other challenges. There, you know, there's got to be something else propelling you to keep you going. Is there any specific goal that you got in mind? Well, I've never had the type of season I think I'm capable of having. I've won 12 races two years in a row in 81 and 82, but I've never really, and I, maybe no race driver ever thinks that he's had his, his best season yet. Uh, in the years, on the two years I won 12 races, uh, I still felt like I could have won 12 more. So that's a goal. But uh, there have been so many great drivers in this sport before me that have set so many records that they'd be humanly impossible to break them. But I want to accomplish as much as I can. I want to win as much as I can. I want to win as many races as I can. I want to win as much money as I can and accomplish as many things as I can. I've already accomplished one of the things that I always wanted, and that was to be the champion. I don't want to be the champion once or twice. I'd like to be the champion from now on, and that's a big goal. But I'd like to have some input into this sport and, and like to think that when it's all said and done and I've retired and gone by the wayside that I had an impact on the sport. That something I've done, something I've created or something I've said had a positive impact on the sport that will have changed the direction of it for the better. Stevie, thanks for joining us. And I want to go back a couple of years. I remember reading about a moment when Daryl had had a pretty serious crash, and I think you brought him back here and uh, drove him home. He was in the back seat of the car, as I recall, with a very, very severe headache. Here's a guy that you love very deeply. Did you, did, in moments like that, do you ever have any thoughts about what am I doing here or what is he doing here? We got to, somehow we got to make this better. <laughs> I'm sure at the, at the time that that accident happened, which was Daytona in February, those thoughts did come, but they left quickly. Um, I'm real satisfied with what Daryl does. I feel good about um, his experience on the track, and I feel good about the safety of the cars. And um, just, just every once in a while, um, I'll think, well, I wonder what it would be like if he had a nine to five job and stayed home. and. But really and truly, I, I like what he does. Well, you do. Uh, she's a pretty good scorekeeper, too, isn't she? And keeps she, you honest out there. She works in the pits and keeps the laps and calculates the gas mileage. And I've, I've run out of gas on the lap. She says I'm going to run out on every time I've ever run out of gas. It's always us trying to stretch it a little bit further that maybe makes us run out on the racetrack. But she tells Junior he can run 60 laps or he can run 65 laps, and that's when we run out of gas. 
school. <laughs> that's why I sent her to, that's, that's why she went to school. <laughs> Had to have somebody that could add and subtract. <laughs> Do you tell him about it when he, I, I'm sure you do when he runs out after you work oh, all yes. those, yeah. I, just, I like him to know that it really wasn't my decision. <laughs> but it is, it, it makes, it makes it a terrific way to spend uh, life together when she is actually participating in a sport that can otherwise be very difficult on marriages, can it? That's, that's what's helped me is that Daryl has always um, included me and involved me in what he's done. And in, instead of expecting me to stay home and and that kind of thing that to me would be a, a terrific strain uh, to be a part because he races not only in the Grand National Division but he races 15 or 20 races in other divisions throughout the year so that's 50 weekends or weeks that you are away um, from home but away together and speaking of including I really do appreciate you including us today and letting us come into your home and talk with you stevie right and daryl thank you so much you're welcome Our pleasure. Our pleasure. and i'm brock yates and thank you for joining us today on the great drive